Okay. So I'm going to kick off with a quote from Peter Norvig. He's one of the big AI people at Google. We don't have better algorithms than anyone else. We just have more data. Now, this is an overgeneralization. I'm sure they do have some very good algorithms. But there's a lot of truth to what he's saying about having a lot of data. If you have a lot of data, your, the final result of your calculations will be a lot more forgiving of mistakes in your algorithms or bad choices in your algorithms than if you had less. And this isn't always the case, but it tends to be the case where... One second. It tends to be the case where rare events have a disproportionate impact on the final result. If you have more data, you're more likely to get these rare events. A really good example of this would be web indexing. So if you're crawling the web and you come across a link for the very first time, that link is going to have a bigger impact on your final index than if you had come across that link for the millionth time. And real-world data is full of examples of this kind of Zipfian distribution. So let's look at what a system with massive data would look like, a modern system. Um, I'm going to only talk about streaming because that's the direction everything seems to be going these days. Usually you have a, a user or an entity out in the world, and from that entity you get a stream of events. These events get fed into a stream processing engine which applies some sort of algorithm. You end up getting a model from the stream processing engine which then gets put into your serving system which then the user interacts with to introduce more events and you get a cycle. Uh, a more concrete example of this would be a music recommendation system. So the user is listening to music and we're getting a stream of events of the songs the user has listened to. These, this stream of events is fed into the recommendation, a recommendation algorithm in the stream processing engine. This produces a listening model for that user and then that's served to the user in the form of recommended songs, which they then listen to, and then the cycle continues. It's important that the user events contains both live and historical data. If a user has recently discovered a new band, we want that to be reflected in the songs that we recommend. But we also need to take into account that the user has been listening to music for many years and have, has kind of hard to change preferences. So we want the historical um, listening preference of the user to be taken into account too. And this data can't just be processed once. So we have a whole team of data scientists who are improving on the recommendation algorithms or finding new ways to use this data. Um, so we need to keep this data around for a long time so that they can validate that their new algorithms work. And if something is good enough to go into production, we need to rerun the whole stream of user events against that to give the user the most accurate and enjoyable experience we can. So this kind of architecture where everything is a stream is usually referred to as a kappa architecture. But in the real world, what we often end up with is something like this. It's called a lambda architecture. So in this case, live events are separated from historical events. And this often happens because usually your live events would come through some sort of messaging system. And a lot of messaging systems just aren't able to grow forever. They have hard limits on how large a topic can grow, so after a certain point, data needs to be moved over to a different data store, some sort of MySQL database or something, and then you end up having two processing pipelines. So the historical pipeline, which will run once a day or a couple of times a day, that's a batch pipeline, produces a partial model. You also have the live events, which are happening as the user is interacting with the system, but this only keeps around a day's worth of data. That goes into a stream processing engine to produce another partial model, and then you end up combining those models and then serving the user with that. 
This is not ideal for a number of reasons. Um, the main one being that you have two pipelines, which means that you have two, two systems or two sets of systems to debug and maintain. You need to hire in the expertise to work on these systems. You can't just move load between these systems um, easily. And it's just a lot more work than you want to do. You also need to implement your algorithms in both streaming and batch paradigms, which um, is double the work. So ideally, what you want would be a true Kappa architecture. And that's what this talk is about. So with Apache Pulsar, you can have an infinite amount of data in a single topic, only limited by your accounting department. Um, the it also has a feature where older data can be moved to cheaper storage while still keeping the same streaming interface. Um, finally, I'm going to talk about Pulsar SQL, which is like it's an SQL layer that you can use to query your entire backlog uh, without having to write a single bit of code. So quickly to introduce Apache Pulsar, um, it's a messaging system. It has both PubSub and queuing semantics, which means it can be used in use cases where you would otherwise use something like RabbitMQ, but it can also be used in use cases where you would use something like Apache, um, Apache Kafka. Uh, originally, it came out of Yahoo. Uh, it was the uh, right-head logging and replication layer for their massive distributed database. Um, it's called Sherpa internally. Um, but it's also called Peanuts in other places, so I'm not quite sure on the naming. Um, it's been out in the wild for maybe four years now. Um, and it's just recently become a Apache top-level project, maybe a month ago, I think. It's built on another piece of uh, technology that also came out of Yahoo. That's also an Apache project, Apache Bookkeeper. And Bookkeeper has been around for many years now. It's I started working on it maybe seven years ago, uh, but it was already going three, year, three years at that point. Apache Pulsar gives you very strong um, persistence guarantees. So if you write a message to a topic in Pulsar, you are guaranteed that any consumer that is reading that topic will see that message in the exact same order with regard to other messages in that stream. So I'll, I'll go into that more later. The software has a lot of features, but I'm only going to concentrate on three today. The unlimited topic, backlog size, tiered storage, and the SQL interface. So before we can talk about what, how we do infinite topic backlogs, I'm going to break down what an actual topic backlog is. So when a user wants to publish to a topic, it writes a message to the broker. The broker then writes that message to a topic backlog. So this is basically a log of all the messages that have been written to uh, that topic. Each topic has, its, has one backlog, or in the case of a partition topic, each partition in that topic has its own backlog. The broker will not reply to the client acknowledging that message until the topic has hit physical hardware. So we f-sync on each message write. And this means that if you have a catastrophic data center failure, you know, like power goes out and everything, then you're still guaranteed that the message will be there when everything comes back up. So once it's guaranteed to be persisted in the topic backlog, then the broker acknowledges the, the um, publication to the client. Let's add a few more. Topic backlog can be broken into is well it is broken into segments, and a segment can either have a open state or a closed state. So there's only one open segment in each topic backlog, and that's the current segment that's been written to. All previous segments in the backlog are what we call closed, and that means they are immutable. Nothing can be added to them, nothing can be removed from them. And the position of each message in that, in that, um, in that segment is fixed. And this gives us a very nice guarantee. Um, so if a client, in this case, writes A, B, and C at position X, 
every consumer that ever comes along and reads forward from position X will see A, B, and C in that order without duplicates and without loss of message. And this guarantee is called total order atomic broadcast, and it's, it's very useful in a lot of places. Um, each segment is, oh, yeah, so you cannot delete anything from a, a closed segment, which means that if you want to remove part of your backlog because of retention policies or whatnot, then you have to delete the whole segment, and that's what Pulsar does, does as if, if you do have a retention policy to delete data. Each segment in the backlog is independent from each other, so they don't actually share anything. They don't even know their order with regard to the other segments in the backlog, but Pulsar does keep track of this in its metadata. Part of this independence is that each segment has its own replication specification. So in this case, segment A, B, and oh, seg this seg the segment with A, B, and C is replicated to storage node one, two, and three. The next segment may be replicated to storage node four, five, and six. And this is how we manage to provide um, infinite backlogs. The segments can go anywhere on the storage layer uh, without being tied to a single machine. So as we, as the backlog grows, we just keep adding storage. So this is what the system usually looks like. We have a storage layer and a serving layer. So each topic is assigned to a broker, and then that broker, as it adds segments to the log, it decides which storage nodes um, to put that segment on. This separation of, serv of serving and storage gives you very nice scaling properties. So if you have a workload where there's a lot of read and write requests, then your, your bottlenecks there is, are going to be CPU and network bandwidth. In that case, what you want to do is start adding broker nodes. And these are generally cheaper machines. You just need a CPU and a, and a, and a NIC. And you add those until you have enough bandwidth to deal with the large amount of requests. However, if you want to have a large amount of data with not so many requests for it, so maybe for each topic, one writer and one consumer, then you need to start adding storage. And these storage nodes tend to be quite expensive compared to the broker nodes because they have disks attached to them. Oh, well, big disks attached to them. So if you want to add more storage, you just add nodes. And Pulsar will handle it. I'll just give an example of how Pulsar handles this. So we have a topic backlog. Each segment gets replicated to two nodes. So we start adding messages to the backlog, start adding segments to the backlog, and eventually you're going to get to a point where your storage nodes are starting to fill up, and you're looking at it, and you're like, if, if I keep going like this, my system's going to fall over in a couple of hours. So you add another storage node. Serving layer will see that another storage node has been added, and it will gradually start to write new data to that storage layer. So note there is no rebalancing taking place here. The old data stays on the old nodes, new data goes to the new nodes. And also, new data goes to one of the old nodes. This allows us to avoid herding, which would take down the new nodes um, immediately. Like if every broker saw, oh, there's a new node, let's just put all our write traffic there, you know, that new node is going to die very quickly. Um, yeah. But it can be quite expensive to... Um, so This way you can grow your backlog forever. You just keep adding nodes. As new segments are added to the backlog, they keep being replicated to... They, they can be, they'll be picked up by the, on the new nodes, and you can grow forever that way. However, this can get expensive. So the replication we're using here is 2x replication. So, and we do this to avoid one storage node going down, taking down part of the backlog. So if one storage node goes down, we are able to continue reading that segment, our segments that were on that storage node, by reading the other 
know that it was replicated to. But this kind of replication is suboptimal. Um, so this would be called mirroring. And in terms of space efficiency, it has a 1 over n space efficiency, where n is the number of nodes, um, so 50% space efficiency, um, which means that we can store half the amount of data we would otherwise be able to store if we weren't d watching out for fault tolerance. Uh, we're basically paying twice as much for disks as we need to. Oh, well, not that we need to, because we need fault tolerance, but we're paying a lot for disks. In this case, we tolerate n minus 1 failures. So one failure, if we had five replicas, we would have be able to tolerate four failures. But really, in Pulsar, you only need to be able to tolerate one failure because there is a background process which, when it spots that a storage node has gone down, it will start, it will go and see which segments were replicated on that storage node and it will start copying from the live copy to another storage node to ensure that the replication for that segment is 2x. <coughs> so we don't really want more than two replicas. Um, and also because I've, if you had more than two replicas, the space efficiency just goes to the floor. So five replicas would have one over five, so 20% space efficiency, not very good. There are other storage schemes which have much better space efficiency. And the one people, I guess, would be most familiar with would be something like RAID 5. So in RAID 5, you have a number of different blocks which are stored on, in this case, we have five different blocks stored on five different nodes. And these five blocks are used to calculate a parity block um, using an algorithm like Reed Solomon or something like that. In the case of a failure, let's say the red node failed, that block could be regenerated by reading all the other blocks. And this has a really good, like, so this is called striping with parity, or that's what I'm calling it. And this is a really nice uh, space efficiency, so it's 1 minus 1 over n. So in this case, uh, with six nodes, we get 84% space efficiency. And this goes up as you start adding nodes. So if you had 10 nodes here, you would have 90% space efficiency. And you still tolerate one failure, which, as I said, is enough for Pulsar. So if you could store your topic backlog in a, in, in, in a system like this, as your system grew to massive topic backlogs, you would save a lot of money. However, it's not practical to store all your topic backlog in a system like this. So to actually generate your parity block, you need to have all the other blocks complete and available. Um, in the case of a messaging system, you're always adding little bits of data to, to the topic backlog. And you're not, with Pulsar, you, Pulsar doesn't actually respond to the client until that's been persisted. Now, if you had to wait for, in this case, five blocks to fill up before you actually responded to the client, then you would be, you would be, um, your latency on writes would just go to the roof. So for the open segments, as I mentioned earlier, this is not practical. But closed segments are immutable, they're complete, and they can easily be moved to a system like this. And that's what tiered storage is about. So we don't actually implement this kind of uh, striping with parity ourselves. We use other systems where that's already been implemented and they already do it well. So this is how it works in, in uh, Pulsar. So client starts writing to the broker, then the broker builds ba the backlog, starts putting segments on the Pulsar storage nodes. Eventually, you're going to hit a threshold. So we support two kinds of threshold for tiered storage. Um, first threshold is a size-based threshold. So when the backlog exceeds a certain size, let's say 100 gigabytes, we start moving the old segments to long-term storage. 
The other kind of threshold is a time-based threshold. So if a segment is, let's say, more than two weeks old, then we start, then we move it to long-term storage. So it gets moved to long-term storage, and it gets deleted from the local storage nodes, which means you need to have fewer local storage nodes than you would otherwise need to have. From the client point of view, this is transparent. So when a client comes along and needs to read these older segments, say it wants to read the whole backlog from the start, it'll talk to the broker, and the broker knows to go to long-term storage. So the client really doesn't know where this data is being stored. For the writes, the writes always go to the storage nodes because that's the open segment, so it's, it's not even taken into consideration. The offload process looks like this. So when we decide that we want to offload a segment, we first update the metadata for that topic, saying that this segment is going to be offloaded to this location. So we do this before the actual offload process to avoid having a case where the offload would, would fail halfway through, and then you'd end up having zombie data using up space in long-term storage and costing you money. So we update with the new location, and then we start moving the messages from that segment um, over to a data object in the long-term storage. The data object is composed of blocks, and we keep track of the first message in each block, and we use this to build an index, um, and that becomes another object in long-term storage. So you end up having, for each segment, you end up having two objects in long-term storage, a data object and an index object. Um, the, the index object isn't necessarily needed. We could actually just have the data object, and then each time you read that segment, just read from the start to find out, find the message that you wanted. But the index, it does avoid ha having to read the whole segment each time when you just want one or two messages. Or, as is often the case, when you're reading from a topic backlog, you don't start at the exact start of, an, of any segment. You usually have a cursor somewhere in the middle of the segment, and you don't want to have to pull the whole segment to get just that, that little bit that you need. So once the index object has been updated and written to long-term storage, then we update the Pulsar topic metadata to say that the, um, the offload process has completed, so we can, you, you can clear up your local storage whenever you want. We don't actually delete the local segment straight away, so we have a grace period, I think default is four hours, um, which we keep the, um, the segment on the local storage just in case something went wrong with long-term storage and you just need to stop the whole offloading process uh, and dig into that deeper. But eventually, the data will be removed from, long -term, uh, from local storage. Or not, it's not even local storage, from the Pulsar cluster storage. And it'll be deleted and... Um, then that space can be used for new segments. So this has been available in Pulsar since version 2.1. Um, and the first implementation we had was for S3 as the object store. Um, version 2.2 went out, I think, three weeks ago. And that added support for Google Cloud Storage. Um, Azure and Hadoop are planned for version 2.3. Um, so the Azure patch is already out. Um, I think the Hadoop, uh, well, HDFS is already complete, but I haven't actually seen the patch pushed yet. And you can also implement your own offloader. Indentation got messed up there somehow. Um, so the interface is as you would expect. You have methods to offload, messages to read the offloaded, messages to delete the offloaded. Um, because you don't, even if you are offloading to long-term storage, you may still have a retention policy on your topic, so you might want to delete those segments after a year, for example. Um, so you implement this interface, and then you bundle it up into what's called a NAR file. A NAR file, it's a NIFI archive. It's like a JAR file with class loader isolation. So usually these, something like S, well, actually S3 is not too bad. 
But something like Hadoop has a lot of dependencies it'll pull in, which will, which will interfere with the Pulsar dependencies in the process. So we need to isolate the, the Java class, class loader. Um, and NAR files allow you to do that. So you bundle up a NAR file with your implementation of the interface, with all the dependencies needed by your implementation. You just drop it in your offloaders directory. And then it is available for you to, um, to use for offloading your data. OK, uh, finally, um, Pulsar SQL. So this has also been available since Pulsar 2.2. And it's an SQL interface that allows you to query all the data in a uh, topics backlog. Um, it's based on PrestoDB. So PrestoDB is a, it's an SQL engine with a, a pluggable data backend. So you tell it where to get the data, and you tell it the format of that data. And that you also map a, its table schema internals to something to tell it how to present that data to the user. So we use the topic schema feature in Pulsar to create the table schema. Um, and this will be clearer uh, when I show you an example. It's important to note that this is for data at rest. So there are some streaming SQL implementations where you put in your query, and the query will, the system will give you results as, the, um, as new data comes in. That's not what this is. So this is for query at rest, so it queries the data that is already in the backlog when you make the query. And the results you get are a, so a final result that you get one time. So to give an example of how we make a query against Presto. So first of all, let's go back to the music example. Uh, we have a listen event. And you, you have everything you're expecting it, the user who's listening, the artist, the title, and the album. So it denotes a song. A user has listened to a song. So we generate a schema object from this class. Um, we support Avro and JSON schema right now. We also do support Protobus schema, but that doesn't work with the SQL stuff yet. So you generate a schema. You tell it you're going to write it to the user profiling topic create a producer, and then you just push a couple of listen events. Now, let's say someone in the rights management department um, wants to see every user who has listened to Dio. So they can just go to their Presto console and write your normal SQL type statement. So you want to select all from Pulsar. It tells Presto to use the Pulsar driver. Uh, public default, that's just a namespace in Pulsar that the topic exists in. Um, so in, in this case, I didn't actually specify a, a user namespace. So it went into the default namespace, which is in the public tenant. Um, the, you specify the namespace, then you specify a uh, user profile in its topic name, and then you put in a normal SQL type clause. Um, and it gives you back a a result like you'd get if you went into MySQL, just like a, a table. Um, there's also, you can have many different um, things in the where clause. I'm not going to go all the way through, you know, Presto's documentation here, but this just give you an example of what you can do this, um, that you can do this with the topic backlog data. And this, it, it doesn't matter if the topic data is stored in the Presto local storage or in long-term storage. So this is another benefit of separating the serving layer from the storage layer. So we have an ab abstraction for the storage layer, and Presto doesn't even go near the serving layer. So Presto has its own serving layer, which is the Presto workers. That's what the Presto client connects to. And these workers use, that ab use the abstraction to pull in the data from either Pulsar storage or long-term storage, be it S3, Google, Google Cloud Storage, or HDFS, when we have it. OK, um, and that's it. I'm going to just summarize. Um, so with Apache Pulsar, you can have unlimited backlog sizes. Um, you can also have a lot of topics. So it's something I didn't touch, but like 
Pulsar can scale to, I think, a million topics was was the number we were putting out there. The only limit is actually what Zookeeper is doing in the background. We can have unlimited topic backlog size. Um, all the data in those topics can be offloaded to much cheaper storage. You can query all that data using an SQL type interface. And at start, I motivated this with a mach machine learning um, recommender system type use case, but there's lots of other use cases for having massive backlogs. Once you have a massive, massive backlog, you can, use a, you can build a CQRS event streaming or event sourcing system, you can build data marts, audit logs, security logs. What's important is since Pulsar does provide the ability to have these massive backlogs, or infinite backlogs, um, then these use cases are all possible. Okay, so if you have any questions, uh, I'll take them. Or you know, I'm on Twitter, so you can ask me there, or just grab me when I'm walking around. Thank you. Sorry, how many? Two. So you need two, a minimum of two on your storage layer, so because you obviously one can crash. Three for Corun or something like this. No, you, what, so this you need three Zookeeper nodes. Okay. So that that is the part I didn't show, but you need three Zookeeper nodes. You need three Bookkeeper nodes and two Pulsar nodes. Um, but yeah. Basically, no, actually, no, I think actually you, you only need two bookkeeper nodes because the reason you need three zookeeper nodes is you need, you need to be able to form a majority um, to get this total order atomic broadcast thing. But that only happens when you, you only need that when you close the ledgers or you close the segments. Um, and that operation involves zookeeper. So zookeeper, you need three. All the rest of them, you just need the minimum that you would need for fault tolerance, which is two. Thank you. And another question. Can you run uh, Pulsar over Kubernetes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what a lot of people are doing now. Um, that's, yeah, no, that's most of our work right now is, is getting it working nice on Kubernetes with Helm charts and all this stuff. But yeah, for sure. Thank you. Um, yeah. Thank you for the talk. Very, very interesting and thought-provoking. I haven't seen a system like like this, but I was wondering uh, uh, the difference between uh, with Apache Kafka because we are seeing here um, about the storage of events and just a, a Presto-based SQL um, engine for storing raw data. But mm. maybe you have to join cross data or el elaborate a, a bit the, the uh, data? So the Presto stuff is the stuff I actually know the least about because I worked a lot on tier storage and the uh, bookkeeper layer. Um, but I, I think joins are, are supported in Presto. So you, you need to look at the Presto documentation to check that. But Presto pulls the data locally and then it will do stuff like joins. So. It's quite a big system. Okay. The big uh, difference, so going back to your first question, what's the difference with uh, Kafka? The main difference with regard to what I've talked about is the separation of the serving and the storage layers. Yeah. So this separation allows us to uh, attach different stuff to the storage layers to provide different use cases. And the last question, um, are there any APIs for external applications uh, apart from Presto? Uh, another application. That yeah, yeah, Presto yeah. has an API itself. So, so you, you, you would have a Presto client library on your own application, and that will connect to the Presto workers. Okay. So if you have an external application, you connect to Presto, that is queries the storage yeah. layer? Okay. So you're not, you're not explicitly using Pulsar when you're using the Presto stuff. You know, it's Pulsar in the background providing the data, but uh, you're actually using Presto. Yeah, that's it. it is, uh, uh, Pulsar is just the backend for the storage. Yeah. Okay, good. Hi. Hi. For a lot of um, data lake style storage, you're going to partition your data usually by date. 
so you can run queries for a specific date and, and have it return in a reasonable time. If you're having infinite topic uh, backlogs being stored in the long-term storage and you're querying it with SQL, is there any partitioning? Uh, I know, understand there's indexing within a segment to get to the offset, but um, anything else? Um, well, the partition, well, the segment is like, it is a time-based okay. partition because so the se like segments are chronologically ordered. Mm -hmm. So the segment, you get kind of that partition natu naturally. So y would the Presto be able to understand the times in the segments to only go to the segments it needs to go to? If you have Again, I'm not 100% okay. sure because I didn't implement it, but... Um, if it doesn't, that's very easy to do. You know, you, you just pull the first message from each one uh, or find... Each, each segment is also dated, so like dated what, when the first message is, so you, you can pull that data very cool. easily. It's, okay. it, it would be very easy to do if yep. we don't do it. I'm not 100% sure if we do do it. Gotcha. But I would be surprised if we didn't. Any more questions? No? All right. Thank you.